When one thinks of organized crime, very often Al Capone is at the top of the list. This mastermind criminal whose antics were facilitated by the prohibition era in U.S. history, Al Capone's famous rise and fall is written as a notorious gangster with a ruthless demeanor. We will explore some interesting elements from his life in this fact-based story brought to you by Liberty. Be sure to check out our sister channel over at Crime Labs. And don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment on your favorite Liberty channel. Alfonso Capone was born on January 17, 1899 in Brooklyn, New York. He was the fourth of nine children born to Gabriella and Teresa who had migrated from Naples in 1893. The Capones lived near the Brooklyn Navy Yard, where many neighborhoods contained too many bars and brothels frequented by sailors, but the family always managed to keep on the legal side of the law. The point being that Capone was by no means destined to become a criminal. However, his short temper was always apparent, and according to Biography.com, he was expelled from school at the age of 14 for hitting a teacher who he felt had disrespected him. Al would never go back to school. Instead, spending the rest of his teens working odd jobs and becoming increasingly involved with the predominantly Italian-American gangs that had been formed across Brooklyn. A knife attack in his youth earned Capone the nickname Scarface. One of these gangs was led by Johnny Torrio, who was to become Al's mentor and facilitate his eventual move to Chicago. The gang made huge profits from the illegal production, transportation, and sale of alcohol. Capone quickly developed a reputation as a big drinker who was always spoiling for a fight, even though he was reserved and kept a low profile. He was arrested in 1923 for drunk driving, and although Torrio used his connections with corrupt city officials to bail him out of prison, it served as a wake-up call for Capone. The same year, his mother and some of his siblings also moved to Chicago, grounding Capone and allowing him to develop as a businessman rather than just a hard drinking man. Torrio had always sought to work in the shadows and avoid media scrutiny, but for the rest of the 1920s, Al Capone was the most visible gangster in the country. He boldly moved his headquarters to a plush suite in the Metropole Hotel in downtown Chicago and paraded his luxurious lifestyle in front of the cameras. He was seen at operas and parties with Chicago's elite, chauffeured in a $30,000 armor-plated car, and always dressed in a pristine suit. He worked with the media to make sure that he received positive coverage, and they gave gushing details of his acts of generosity for struggling families and communities. With Prohibition becoming increasingly unpopular, Capone was seen as a man of the people figure whose only crime was to provide the public with what they wanted. Using his connections in New York, he started to develop a lucrative trade in whiskey and combined with the money he made from running brothels and gambling joints, his net worth in 1927 was estimated at an astronomical $100 million. It was Capone's greatest triumph in his gang wars that would lead to his downfall. He was aware that Bugs Moran had ordered a hit on him, so he plotted a move that would permanently eliminate the North Side threat. At around 10.30 on the freezing cold morning of February 14, 1929, Capone's men disguised themselves as policemen and staged an arrest at a garage owned by Moran. Moran's men complied with the order to hand over the guns, but they were not especially worried. After all, this was not the first time they had been shaken down by police. They lined up with their faces to the wall, expecting, at the very worst, to be arrested and eventually bailed out by their boss. But Capone's men savagely opened fire with machine guns, and all but one of the seven Northsiders were dead before they even knew what was happening. The seventh victim, a man named Frank, died after the real police arrived on the scene. The incident became known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Al Capone was indicted on tax evasion charges in 1931. 
The government knew that they would never be able to pin his more egregious crimes on him because to do so would require witnesses who could easily be intimidated or bribed by his gang. Instead, they used Capone's lavish lifestyle against him, forcing him to try and explain why he had paid such a little amount of taxes when he clearly had such a huge income. Capone's situation appeared not to be desperate. He struck a deal with prosecutors where he would plead guilty and receive less than five years in prison. But the judge threw the agreement out. Capone then pled not guilty and fully expected to be acquitted because he had his cronies work the jury with the usual routine of threats and bribes. However, at the last moment, the judge replaced the entire jury and Capone was left helpless as he was convicted and sentenced to 11 years in federal prison. He was taken away from the court and from his life at the top. Capone spent the first two years of his sentence in Georgia, but after it was discovered that he had made numerous attempts to bribe the guards, he was transferred to the recently opened Alcatraz prison, perched on a rock in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. His health would decline quickly here. His use of prostitutes in his younger days began to catch up with him as he had contracted the STD syphilis. By 1939, doctors discerned that Capone had the mental capability of a 12-year-old, and he was sent to a hospital in Baltimore to serve out the rest of his sentence. After being released in 1942, he lived in Miami with his wife, May, until he died at the age of 48. Thank you for listening to this episode of Liberty. We hope you have truly enjoyed it and will hit the subscribe button, like, share, and comment to show your support. And be sure to let us know what other future historical narratives you'd like to hear from us.